Welcome to the On Screen In Person podcast. I'm Kimberly Steinley Super, Program Associate at Mid Atlantic Arts Foundation. Launched in 2011, On Screen In Person tours new independent American films and their respective filmmakers to communities across the Mid Atlantic region. On Screen In Person is made possible through the generous support of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm on the line with Jill Ann Spitz Miller, co director of the film Still Dreaming which will be touring in March of 2015. Thanks for joining me today, Jillian. Thank you for having me. Still Dreaming follows a group of elderly entertainers residing at the Lillian Booth Actors' Home and two young directors from New York as they attempt to stage a reading of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. And through this experience, the audience gets this very touching and powerful look at aging. What would you say was the most important or unexpected thing that you took away from the experience of making this film? Well, you know, this was a journey like any other film, and um, it was a very unexpected journey for us as filmmakers, I think. Um, When we first conceived of this film, we just sort of had the misconception that the actors we were going to follow and the people at the Lillian Booth Actors Home um, would be much more physically able and um, much more healthy, you know, than they were. I think we sort of had this unrealistic picture of, oh, they're going to jump right up and, and get into this play and memorize everything, and if it's really good, maybe you know, here we were dreaming for our grant proposals. Maybe they can take it on the road. Maybe they can do a show in New York City. And it really didn't turn out that way at all. Um, So what the outcome was was actually incredibly unexpected, but so much more, I think, valuable and meaningful than what we could envision um, from that grant writing stage. And what happened in reality over the course of filming was that Um, we realized that the the population of elders that we were working with had many more limitations than we thought. Um, So there was Alzheimer's in the group, there was dementia, there was almost complete loss of sight, there was, you know, hardness of hearing, there was um, disorientation sometimes and and, um, physical limitations about, you know, how much could they move around. So at first, I think we were in a little bit of shock, you know, like, oh, gosh, um, is this going to work out? And, and how in the heck is this going to work out? And I think that the for the viewer, the experience is the same because you sort of come in through the eyes of two young co-directors who are in their 30s. And they're coming in from New York City every day to work with the elders at the Lillian Booth. And I think they're also very surprised at sort of what they find in the beginning of the process and the abilities that people have. Um, and the group of residents that worked on the play, um, there was there was about a group of 15 or 13 residents and, and 15 altogether, including the co-directors. So it was a pretty sizable group and many different variables um, within that group. And so the directors had to sort of figure out where each person was at and then how are they going to work at you know in all those different realities as they say in the film there's all these different realities going on at once um so that was sort of the the very complicated situation that that we started out with and what we ended up with was this very surprising result in terms of how important it was for everyone in the group to be engaging in this process like how much it impacted them so, you know, whereas Hank uh, Rogerson, my filmmaking partner and husband and I kind of, we went into making the film with with the question, um, how is the process of creativity going to affect and impact this group of elderly people? And, you know, I think we had a suspicion that it would have a positive impact. I don't think we were prepared for how positive an impact it did have and and how much it didn't matter what people's abilities were, you know, that all that mattered in the end is that they showed up and they engaged in whatever way they could and that that made a big difference for each of them. Can you tell us a little bit about how the whole idea to produce the reading came about and also how you became involved? 
we had done a film in that came out in 2005 called Shakespeare Behind Bars, and that followed a group of 20 male inmates in a Kentucky prison doing a Shakespeare play. Uh, they did The Tempest, which is about forgiveness, and it was such a powerful experience. I, I'm not a Shakespeare buff, or I wasn't really in any way, but this seeing these guys go through a nine-month rehearsal process and really transform themselves um, was just mind-blowing. So I think we were interested in, um, we're always interested in how creativity impacts people, and um, we were interested in looking at another sort of unique group of people. And, and during the funding process for Shakespeare Behind Bars, one of our funders said, hey, well, you guys should think about doing Romeo and Juliet in an old folks' home. And we thought, oh, my God, that's a great idea. <laughs> so when we were done with Shakespeare Behind Bars, um, we had a lot on our plate, but we did come back to that this idea of Shakespeare in an old folks' home. And we looked around and, and thought, well, maybe we should try to get a group of people who have already been actors because – dealing with an aging population and, you know, new actors might be too much. So there were two places that we looked at, and one was the actor's home, um, the Lillian Booth in New Jersey. And, and they, they already had a Shakespeare club, and they already had some drama activities and um, things that were going on there, and it was a really wonderful place. And we made a few visits and started getting to know people there. And the administrator of the home, Jordan Stroll, who's a really great leader um, of that home, was very enthusiastic about doing a bigger project, and um, as was the Actors Fund that that runs the home. So, you know, they thought it would be a really good way to boost quality of life for the residents. So we all sort of jumped in together and um, took what was already there and and just. Um, gave it a little more boost uh, with bringing in these outside directors and pretty much then, you know, we just sat back with our cameras and, and watched what happened and it was really remarkable. <laughs> the film follows a fantastic group of characters who have led very interesting and vibrant lives. What were some of the joys and challenges of filming with the group and were any of the residents sort of hesitant to be filmed? There are so many great characters in this film, so many wonderful people with a depth of experience. And I would say about half of them were Broadway entertainers and, and half of them weren't. You can live at the Lillian Booth Actors Home if you have some tie to entertainment. So it could just be that a family member of yours is, is in entertainment. So one of the really interesting things was seeing these sort of non-actors um, bloom you know as we had sort of set out to to use just experienced actors we found that the non-actors had just as interesting of you know a journey as the actors some of the my favorite moments um and and people were there was there's a woman in the film named charlotte fairchild and she did a lot on broadway broadway um singing singing dancing um she was in 42nd street and she was uh, Angela Lansbury's understudy in MAME, and she was in Fiorello, and just many really well-known um, Broadway shows. And she has Alzheimer's, and um, it's not apparent initially because, you know, we sort of have a, a stereotype of people with Alzheimer's being um, sort of irritable or more difficult to deal with, and Charlotte has this incredibly sunny and fun personality. And so it's very deceptive because you think, oh my gosh, this person is totally with it. She's an incredible singer. And, um, but then, you know, you'd, you'd come in the next day after having rehearsed and watched a rehearsal and she'd say, um, a film crew, you know, as if she'd never seen us before. And she'd say to the directors, oh, what part am I playing? You know, and here she'd been rehearsing Puck for weeks. She plays the part of Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, so that was really interesting. And also to see her just all her inherent talents and all her experience come through every day in rehearsal. Like she was just, you couldn't take your eyes off her because she's so charismatic, magnetic, talented, and in the moment. So the fact that she had Alzheimer's actually 
had very little impact on her performance, except, you know, she needed to have the lines there with her. And one thing that um, happened is her, her aide, who's always with her, ended up being having a part in the play as a fairy and sort of helping her do the blocking and, and the staging. Um, so that was sort of a challenge, um, one of those unexpected challenges, but it also had this incredibly positive side to it, too. And there were residents who were hesitant to be filmed, but they didn't. They just didn't participate. So it was sort of a self-selected group who were interested in this process or who were avid theater um, people in the past, and they just hadn't had a chance to perform in a long time. Um, there's one woman, Aideen O'Kelly, who had been in also many Broadway shows and in Othello with Christopher Plummer and James Earl Jones. And she says at the beginning of the process, you know, uh, this is my whole life and, and uh, it means everything for me to come back to it, you know, because um, she hasn't been on stage in a long time. And it, we find out that actually she's pretty much lost her sight. So she can't work in the professional arena anymore. Um, because of the insurance liabilities, she might fall off the stage, or you know, so that was kind of just the crazy reality of of her physical limitations. But then when she gets back in it, in this group and in this setting, you, you see her just her sort of raging talent come through again, and it's very rewarding. Although, you know, then she has health issues come up. So I think for everyone, they're walking this tightrope of desire and reality and um and that's really interesting because it reflects these themes in the play which are dreaming versus reality and midsummer night's dream is really rich in terms of this um theme of what is real and what are we dreaming and we found that to be really relevant to this group of people and we, we explore that a lot in the film you know, a lot of times when we're shooting, we're in these really difficult situations, like in a prison every day or, um, you know, but I felt like going to the actor's home was a joy every day, even though there was always the unpredictability and always the emotional challenges. Um, but I felt like I was walking into this um, magical space of of um, creativity and connection, and, and that became stronger as the play was explored with this group of people. I'd like to turn our discussion back to you as a filmmaker. Can you give our listeners some information about your own background and how you came to the world of filmmaking? It's interesting because Hank and I met in college at Dartmouth College in 1985, and uh, I had filmmaking was just not on my radar at all. Um, I was interested in studio art and French, and he was majoring in English, and we were just friends, and uh, but we ha hung out in the film department. We both sort of fell into the film department world and never looked back. And I always just felt like documentary was a calling for me. So we've um, been making films together since about 1987, and um, we're married as well and have two kids. We tend to make long-range, character-driven projects. Um, and, you know, look at a sort of a unique group of people. Um, our films explore creativity and dreaming and um, I think have a real spiritual undertone um, in terms of, you know, the human spirit striving for more and striving for authenticity and striving for answers and striving for fulfillment. Um, so we, you know, we create together. Um, both of us also teach, and we have a company called Documenters where we also help other filmmakers um, sort of up their game and, and navigate the film industry. Um, I felt like mentorship is so important, and it's something I felt like I needed more of. Uh, there's no real straight path for filmmakers out there, especially independent filmmakers. So we we like to support other filmmakers with with that as well and that's um that's our our full life <laughs> thanks so much for sharing all these great insights joanne i look forward to seeing you on tour great i look forward to seeing you all